for some of us, and including myself, uh, a great deal of stress, a great deal of anxiety, and uh, I experienced that on levels I never had before. So 2003, 4, 5, and so on, um, I went through times of extreme stress, and what I'm talking about there is the inability to sleep, uh, the, the mind that keeps running when you lie down at night, and you think, I'm really tired, my body is ready for sleep, but my brain is far away from sleep. And the mind churning around, and the feeling in my body of a, a great deal of tension. Uh, I, I would think back to times when I was a younger man, when I could sit in a bath, in a hot bath, and just relax and feel fully relaxed. And at that point in my life, I just could not feel fully relaxed. There was always some tension somewhere in my body, in a muscle, in a joint, or in my stomach, or in my chest. Um, one day before church, on a Friday night, I, I, was, I thought I was having a heart attack. I had pain in my chest. This was, I don't know when this was, 10 years ago or so. And I, I, I didn't know what was going on. I thought I feel dizzy. And I, I, Lydia, my daughter, was there. And I, so I just sat on the floor. And I said, Lydia, you need to call for an ambulance. So she rang for an ambulance. The paramedic came. They took me to the hospital. Um, some, I was particularly anxious about the fact that it was Friday night and I was doing the, the lesson. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, God took care of all that. Other people dealt with that. I ended up in the hospital. I didn't have a heart attack. I was hyperventilating. I was having something like a panic attack. Wow. I didn't know what that was. I went to the London School of Theology to study some theology uh, back around that time, and I really enjoyed it. But the stress of trying to do ministry and do deal with church issues at that time and study for a degree, uh, just a combination was too much for me. And so I triggered, in my opinion, I think that's what triggered some IBS and irritable bowel syndrome that I still have as a, as a challenge today. I went through significant periods of depression when it was very difficult to get out of bed and motivate myself for anything. Uh, I lost the sense of joy. Uh, just, just to look at a flower or a bird or a sunset and go, wow, there was no wow in my life for periods during that time. Um, the, the, those things stayed with me um, up and down at different times. There were some particularly low points, like my wife and I celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary five years ago, and we took two weeks to go to South Africa and just enjoy our wedding anniversary. One of the lowest points for me was being celebrating this wedding anniversary, it's 25 years, we're in South Africa in a beautiful place called Nature's Valley, we're on a walk in a place which has got the most exotic birds and everything, and I did not enjoy one minute. Wow. One I couldn't. And, I, I, and the problem was I was rebuking myself for not enjoying it, <laughs> which makes it worse, but that's where you, that's where you go. I mean, wow. maybe you don't, but I'm saying for a lot of people, yeah. that's where that's where we go. And so um, I'll share more about the, the, some of the things that I've been through and, and that have helped me over the last few years as we go through. And if we have time for some Q&A, maybe we'll talk some more. But I just want to set that out there at the beginning so that you know where I'm coming from as not someone who's saying, you know, if you're stressed, here's the Bible, just repent. I, I'm, I'm talking here as just a brother, as someone who's struggled with some of these things, as I'm sure many of us have. Or will do. Not that I want to be a prophet <laughs> for your life. I'm just saying there are things ahead that you are not yet prepared for. Yeah. And that's going to be a challenge when they appear. Yeah. So what tonight for partly is about helping some of us who are in the middle of some of this to try and see, to get a sense of hope. <laughs> that it may not always have to be like this. Mm. And there is hope. For some of us that have been through some of these things, I hope it will give context to what we've been through spiritually, so that also we'll be equipped to help other people when they go through these challenges. And then for some of us who've not yet experienced some of the overwhelming senses of stress, depression, and anxiety, well, maybe you'll be better prepared for when they come. And I hope you'll be able to hold on to faith through those times. It is a great tragedy that too many people I know and that you know have left the Lord out of a mistaken way of thinking that their depression or their anxiety is somehow an indication that they are not spiritual enough mm. for God to love them. Mm. May that never be the case for any of us again, I pray. So let's uh, talk about some of these uh, issues tonight. 
And um, my, my feeling is this, that God has a plan for stress in our lives. We'll talk about stress and then we'll talk about anxiety. God has a plan for stress. Stress is not evil. Stress in itself is not a bad thing. I believe that God's plan for stress is that we, what, we have things in our lives that happen, a new job, a baby, a health challenge, many things cause us to feel stressed. Uh, deadlines at work, uh, the tax man, whatever it is that you feel stressed about, things happen. When those things happen, uh, we can feel a sense of stress. But it's my conviction that God allows, even causes, you could say, stress in our lives so that we grow. God's goal with stress, the, the, uh, the existence of stress in this world, is not in itself a bad thing. You, you and I know, if we think back to um, growth periods in our lives, uh, often those periods of spiritual growth in our lives are very closely connected to being challenged in some way, a bit out of our depth, a bit out of our comfort zone. And I think that's God's plan for stress. The question is whether we're in touch with it. Mm. Second Corinthians 1, Paul writes this, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life itself. Does that sound like Paul went through a stressful period? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Indeed, we felt the sentence of death. But this happened. Aha! So Paul's perspective on this stress is this. This happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. What is Paul telling us there? He's telling us that God was teaching him to rely on him and through a difficult situation like this. I think that's God's plan, if you like, for stress. So stress, what happens is, um, all of life is stressful, actually, I think, pretty much. I mean, just about everything, I mean, just the whole of life is stressful. Um, but it depends on where your stress level is habitually as to whether we handle it well. So if your stress level is, around your ankles, if it's like some water, you're standing in some water, and it's like paddling, pool, pool tight, it's fine, you can splash, you know, it's okay, right? Especially if it's nice warm water. If it's down there, it's okay. We can handle paddling pool level stress, if that's the average. And then in life, what happens is that we get waves of stress. And so you're in the paddling pool, but into some kind of wave machine, perhaps in a swimming pool or something, and you get a wave, and the waves of stress are okay. I mean, they're not pleasant. You get a big deadline at work, you're about to get married, you're, you're, um, suddenly you're, one of your in-laws is about to move in for three months. I mean, these, <laughs> these, these, these things are stressful. <laughs> They're definitely stressful. But if they come in waves, it's okay, because sometimes actually waves can be quite fun. I love the wave machines in swimming pools, you know, and you get lifted from the floor even sometimes, but you know you're coming back down to the ground. And the waves come, and then they go, and, they, and you go back to the paddling pool level of stress. It's fine. It's temporary. And I think that leads us to growth, the accomplishments on the screen there. Things happen. We meet a deadline. We get some work done. We handle a dissertation. I mean, things get, that's how things get done, and that's okay. But the problem is not when the waves come. The problem is when the, the, the level is rising, and it's, it's up to your chin. And, and you, you can't see it going down. It's not going down. As far as you can see, someone is pouring the water in and there is no plug. And you're feeling like you're drowning. Mm. That's when stress is a problem. What do we do with that situation? What we do with that situation is that we need to make a decision. When we're in stress to the point where we feel we're drowning or about to drown, we have to make a decision. We've got to do something about it. What shall we do? What can we do? Mm. This is important because otherwise if we stay at this drowning level it is likely that we will get into some kind of depression and I don't mean being a bit miserable. I'm talking about a, a depression that is an ongoing problem. We'll talk more about it in a minute. And or we will get very anxious. Again, not a 
wave of anxiety, but a feeling of anxiety that does not appear that it will end. Depression and anxiety are very strongly linked when we're talking about clinical depression and uh, an ongoing challenge with anxiety. Uh, it is more often the case that people with depression are also anxious than not. And so this is where we don't want to be. We don't want to be um, in an ongoing stressful situation. Some of us may feel it's okay, I can handle it. Honestly, I would say to you, I think it's very unlikely you can handle ongoing stress at that level of where you feel like you're going to drown. It is very likely that you will end up in depression or severe anxiety or both. And let's, with brothers, we don't want to be there. No. Do we? we don't. So what do we do? Well, we have to understand something called the Yerkes Dodson Law. I knew okay. you wanted to know about right. it. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to put all this on the website, so everything will go on there if you don't get, get it written down or whatever. But what, we, what we're looking at here is simply the idea that, uh, that some stress is useful, but it's at the medium level. We get the best and optimum performance. But beyond that, when we're getting into this drowning kind of stress, then we get into anxiety, and often that's when we get into panic mode, we give in to our struggles with anger, and we become violent. And it's just a, a fact, brothers, that Christians are not, Christian men are not immune from the challenges of fits of rage. Mm, yeah. This comes out especially in marriage mm. and with our children. And our wives and our children are the least able to handle our outbursts of anger and evil. And so it's important that we learn to deal with the issues of over, being overstressed, potentially depressed and anxious, not just for ourselves, but for the people around us that we really care about. So, some stress is okay, but drowning is not. Now let's talk a little bit about depression just for a moment. I'm not going to talk a, a lot about depression tonight. Penny is doing her class mostly on depression uh, with the sisters. Uh, being a GP, she has an in-depth knowledge of not only the medical issues, but some spiritual perspectives. I'm not a doctor, and being married to one gives me a bit more insight into some of the medical issues, but I'm not going to talk here, I don't talk too technically, because that's not my expertise. So I, if you want to know more about the depression issues, I would recommend you listen to Penny's class, which I assume will be recorded. But what I do want to say about depression is that it is not being unhappy. It is not just I'm a bit fed up. That's not depression. Depression is very different from that. Now, it's important because sometimes we joke or use the word loosely, and it's okay to use it loosely, but we need to know we're using it loosely, and we're not actually talking about true depression. So if someone comes in the fellowship, and you say, how was your week, bro? And they say, God, dear, I just feel a bit depressed. Usually what we mean by that is, I've had a tough day, I'm a bit fed up, I'm really looking forward to being with you tonight and going home and having a cup of tea and going to bed and getting ready for the week. I mean, I'm looking forward to that. I mean, that's what we normally mean, right? Right. But not, that's not what we're talking about here tonight. So, again, I'm not going to go through all of this now. I'll put this on the website. But real depression is, is something uh, like this. You have at least one of the two core symptoms of persistent sadness or low mood nearly every day and or you have a loss of interest or pleasure in most activities. Nothing gets you excited anymore. Plus, also, you have some of the following symptoms. Fatigue and a loss of energy, worthlessness, excessive or inappropriate guilt, recurrent thoughts of death, suicidal thoughts, actual suicide attempts, diminished ability to think, to concentrate, or increased indecision, psychomotor agitation or retardation, insomnia or hypersomnia, and changes in appetite or weight loss. Now, if you've got one or more of the core symptoms and you've got some of the other challenges in your life regularly below that, I seriously suggest that what you need to do is, well, this class may help, but you also need to see a doctor. That's my doctor. My personal doctor. You can see your own doctor. Uh, my wife's a wonderful GP, and uh, I very much appreciate being married to her. And she's helped me a lot. But now, ultimately, we all need to go and see our own doctor if we're in a kind of state that I just talked about. It's beyond just fellowship. It's beyond that just praying with one another. Praying with one another is an important part of helping one another, but it is not uh, all that we need. We need more than that when we get into this situation. Um, I, I want to address briefly the issue of, of 
medication. In, in, in some Christian circles, and with some Christians, the feeling that taking medication for mental health issues is, you know, is not allowed. It's, it's like it's just about sin and faith. I, I would put it to you, at least this one little point. Um, I imagine that all of us feel okay about taking paracetamol. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay. You know the paracetamol, if you've got a pain in your uh, jaw or something, and you take paracetamol, paracetamol is not working on the pain in your jaw. Paracetamol is working on your brain. It's dealing with the pain receptors in your brain. So why would we think it's okay to take paracetamol to affect our brain so that we don't feel pain? And it's not okay to take another medication which affects our mood, affects our brain, to affect our mood so that we can actually carry on with life and live as a Christian. There's an inconsistency in thinking in these areas. And I think we need to discuss and debate and talk about and pray about a lot more. Yeah. Uh, not just in our church, but I think in general in Christendom. So that's our point to think about, and I'm not going to expand on today. So, where do we want to get to next? So, we want to avoid anxiety. Let's see if we can avoid this. What does Paul say? Do not be anxious about anything. Goodness me, Paul. He's, he's not leaving anything out like that. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, let me ask you a question. And you don't have to put your hand up, but just in your own heart. I haven't, haven't you tried this formula and found it sometimes doesn't work? <laughs> I mean, there's lots of things I've been anxious about, and I have prayed and petitioned God, and I've given him some thanks, and I've presented my request to God, and it doesn't change how it's interesting. So is Paul just giving us an unrealistic demand? I don't think so, because I'll explain what I mean in a minute. Here's the interesting thing about Paul. He says in chapter 4, don't be anxious about anything. Two chapters earlier in, in Philippians 2, he says, therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad. I may have less anxiety. Mm. What? So Paul, who's saying, don't be anxious about anything, is himself confessing to being anxious. So what's going on? Well, what we have is we have Paul being a normal human being. Knowing that God has the resources to help us with our anxiety, but himself being honest about the fact that he himself struggles with different kinds of anxiety. The words are different in the Greek. In, uh, in uh, the case of uh, Philippians 2, it's the word aliputeros, meaning to be free from pain or free from grief or sorrow. In the other verse, it's merimna, uh, to care about, to have anxiety, to have concern or worry. And the word that we see most often in the New Testament connected with anxiety is the word worry, is the Greek word here, merimna. That's the word that's used in most of the passages that talk about worry. Worry. Worry is one of those things that plagues the human race. Mm. I, I think most of the campaigning in the election was about politicians trying to get you to worry about what the other party will do more than you worry about what their party will do. And therefore vote for the party you're least worried about. Honestly, I would seriously suggest the thing. Most of us ended up, I'm not asking who you voted for, Alex, but most of us probably voted for the party who worries us the least. <laughs> Good point. What do we worry about? This is uh, from a survey. 30% 30 30 are things in the past that can't be changed. 40% are things that will never happen. 12% are things relating to other people's opinion of us. 10% are things relating to health issues, which actually worry only makes it worse. 8%. 8% of the things that we worry about are things that need us to take action. That's interesting. So 92% of things that we worry about are things we can do nothing about. So why do we worry about them? What's happening in our mind? Well, as Corey Ten Boom said, worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. When we worry about what's coming and we don't even know if it's going to arrive, our energy and our focus is all there in an unknown and we lose the joy of the day that God has given us. The day that God has given us. 
I think it goes back to Matthew 6. I'm, I know you can't read all of that on the screen. That's not the point. I'm, in the red there, the word worry or worrying. This is Jesus in Matthew 6. Don't worry about your life, what you eat, drink, body, what you wear. Life more important than food, body more important than birds in the air. Look at them. They don't sow, they don't reap. Look at the um, look at the flowers. Why are you worried? You can't hang, add a single hour to your life. Don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about what should we eat. Um, the last verse, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus taught a lot about worry. He taught a lot about worry because he knows who we are. That in our fallen state, having rebelled against God, that worry is part of our life. And we struggle with it. It's interesting how much Jesus talks about worry. Have you ever done a Bible study on worry? I mean, it's good to do Bible studies on characters and, and faith and hope and love and things, but what about a, a Bible study on worry? And what Jesus and what the Bible says about it, I think that could be very, very useful, don't you? We don't need to worry about these other things. What is, God, what is Jesus trying to help us to do here? I think it's really interesting that he says, look at the birds, and he says, look at the, the, the flowers in the field. And to his audience, of course, who are outdoors with him, I imagine he's pointing. He said, look at the birds, and they've got some birds flying on the head. He said, look at the flowers in the field there over there. And people are looking at them. What are they now not doing? They're not looking into themselves anymore. Mm. They're not looking at their worries. They're not looking at the what ifs of tomorrow that haven't yet happened, or the what did happen six years ago that they can't change, or what that person in the third row is thinking about them because they're, they're not wearing the shirt they thought would look good, and they're now they're thinking that someone will look. They're not thinking about that. What Jesus is trying to do is not so much say something doctrinal about birds and flowers. He's trying to say, Change your, the focus of your thinking. Move your mind somewhere else that will help you to contemplate the provision and the power and the love of God. And in the end, brothers, the only thing that's going to help us with our anxiety is getting a better, clearer, focused picture on the provision, the power, and the love of God. Only if we do that will we get any chance of changing how we feel about the things that we are most anxious about. This, I believe, is what Jesus is trying to do in this passage in Matthew chapter 6. Here's an exercise for you. You can do this another time, but um, how, what time did we finish, Mike? I forgot. Uh, quarter me. two. Quarter two. All right, so we're all right. I guess have a little bit of interaction here with the group. Okay. So here's, earlier in the chapter, we, the, begin, the passage I showed you starts with a therefore. Earlier in the chapter of Matthew 6, we have what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer. I think this is very connected with our issues of worry. It's all in the same uh, sermon on the Mount, the same chapter here. So, how would praying, our Father, hallowed be your name, praise be your name, holy be your name, how, how would that help us with our issues of worry? Why would Jesus t teach us to do this? What do you think? I'm sorry? Get our focus on God. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Yes? I think it's the word Father, really. Helps. Okay. Father, as opposed, as opposed to Lord or Yahweh, I mean, there's a reason we have Father. The relationship thing. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. Any other thing that might help us with our worry? Focusing on heaven, things above. Okay. Our God is in heaven, it's a reality, and that's where we're going. Yeah, I was going to say, We get a, a proper sense of his love for his father, but then hallowed as if he is other. He has that power. So we have, that could help us, couldn't it? What about, son, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What about that section of the prayer? How can that help us with our worry and our, and our anxiety? What do you think? Move on? Okay, third one. Give us today our daily bread. Okay, how can that help us with our worry and our anxiety? about today. Isn't it interesting? Give us our daily bread. I don't think it means give me my bread today and every day this week. I think it is, the Greek more seems to imply it's about today's bread. Just give me today's bread and I'll be happy. Why is that important? I don't even know if I'm going to be alive tomorrow to need any bread. So God, just give me today's bread. 
That's a really healthy place to be. You say, God, I just need enough for today. Enough bread, enough money, enough food, enough encouragement, enough faith. I just need enough for today. Tomorrow might be looking like it's going to be a stressful day. But for all I know, it's not even going to arrive. So God, just give me what I need today. I think that's at the core of this prayer. I think it's right at the heart of the prayer. I think it's vital to the understanding of the prayer and to the understanding of Matthew 6 as a whole. It's just about today. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about the birds. Don't worry about the clothes, the food. Look at the birds. They have enough food for the day. Look at the clothes, the, 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 the grass, the flowers, the field. They have enough for today. You pray for what you need today. Do not worry about tomorrow. Right. It's very liberating. Uh, forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. How might that help us not to worry? Excellent, thank you. It, it acknowledges that there are some things that well, we can't forgive ourselves for stuff. We need God. Well, this prayer is acknowledging, surely, the fact that God wants to forgive, wants to clear up. I think, to me, this is about having a clear conscience. God, clear my conscience. Forgive my sins. Help me to forgive others. I want to forgive others. I want to have a clear, nothing between you and me, God. Nothing between me and my fellow human beings. I, have, I want to have a clear conscience. The last one, lead me not into temptation, deliver us from the how might this prayer help us not to be people stuck with worry? Mm. Good insight. Okay, so the forgive us our debts is about the past. Lead us not into temptation is about the future. So God, take care of my past and take care of my future. Very good. We'll move on because of time. But can you see how Jesus is helping his disciples to have a different way of thinking about their lives? Yeah. This isn't just a prayer, just as a model or a it's not just that, it's, it's, and it is that, but it's more than that. It's Jesus retraining his disciples how to think about themselves and God and the challenges that they have and that they are going to have. Uh, some of you will know Walter Evans, who used to be here in London and uh, was then in um, Manchester and Birmingham and is now in Philadelphia, a good friend of ours. And uh, he uh, discipled me for a year back in the, uh, back in the 80s. Anyway, um, uh, one, of the, one time we sat down and he said, Malcolm, why am I discipling you? Which, oh, uh, 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 what's the right answer to that question? Uh, uh, because someone asked you to, uh, I suppose, I don't know. He said, no, 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 why, what's the point? Kind of, what, do you, what do you think I'm trying to achieve in helping you grow in Christ and mature and all that? I mean, like, you know, what, what's the Oh, I don't know. It was your uh, <coughs> teaching me how to study the Bible with people and this and that and this and that. And he said, "Okay, yeah, fine." But he said, "No." He said, "I'll tell you why I'm I'm discipling you. I'm training you how to think like Jesus." Hmm. I thought, what a profound and <laughs> simple thing. Discipling, uh, well, however you want to use that term or phrase, but helping one another to grow in Christ. It's about helping each other to think more like Jesus. And I think this prayer helps us to think differently, more like Jesus did, about our lives and about the challenges that we have. Did any, any, of, us, <coughs> any of us have a more stressful, potentially anxious life than Jesus? The whole of the history of salvation was on his shoulders. The salvation of all of humankind depended on him not giving up and not sinning every day. That's a big burden. That's stressful. And that would cause anxiety in any of us in a, in a, in a way that would blow our mind. But he handled it. His way of thinking about God meant he could handle that pressure. He's teaching and training us through his word how ourselves, how we can handle the anxiety and the pressures in our own lives. At the end of that passage, he says, Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Gosh, isn't that true? I don't need any extra trouble at the end of any day. I love the King James Version of that verse. Take therefore no thought for the morrow. For the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Last sentence. Sufficient unto the day 
is the evil thereof. I love that phrase. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. There's enough evil in every day. I don't need any extra. But it's just today. I'm not thinking. I'm worrying about tomorrow. One of the key things I think is this. In Colossians 4, Paul says this about prayer to the Colossians. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Let's unpack this a little bit. Give me some definitions of devotion. What would it mean to be devoted in prayer? What do you think? What would that mean? Devoted. Serious. Serious. Okay. Yep. Persistent. Persistent. Daily. Daily. Prioritize. Prioritize. Okay. Disciplined. Disciplined. Good word. Fully committed. Fully committed. With feeling. With feeling. Yeah. Consumed. 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 Need for purpose. Need for purpose. Focus. Yeah. Okay. A lot of we can we can go on right. But it's that kind of wholeheartedness. Maybe is that what it is? It's not about length, right? I don't think. He doesn't say 20 minutes, two hours. He just devoted. It's a wholeheartedness, I think. A focus. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful. Now, why does he put watchful? What an odd word. In my mind, what an odd word to put in a verse about prayer. Be devote yourselves to prayer, being thankful. Makes sense to me. But being watchful. What's that about? Why would he put watchful in? What do you, what do you think? We can be deceived by the worries that are, are around us, yeah. So you can see God working in your life. Seeing. Which are? From God. From God. Seeing, seeing what God's doing. It's about noticing. as easy as that. I'm not saying it's as simple as that. I'm not saying it's as easy as that. 
it may take a lot of prayer, and perhaps it might take some fasting, and perhaps it might take a lot of encouragement from your brothers and sisters, but it can be done. We'll put that on the website. Um, Psalm 139, verse 23. God knows we need to be uh, dealing with the inside. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. The psalmist is inviting him in to say, I'm anxious, help me out. Know these thoughts. Let me be real with you. God wants us to be real. Psalm 94, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. God's consolation deals with our anxiety, not just a change of circumstances. Sometimes a change of circumstances makes no difference to how we feel. It's God who gives us mm. the consolation. He, he formed us. He knows how it works. We do have the need for friends. Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. A kind word. Not a necessarily a rebuking word. Not necessarily, uh, you know, I'm really struggling with some anxiety. It's okay, bro, I'm praying for you. That's not necessarily a kind word. It may be lovingly intended, but kindness is closely associated with gentleness, which is associated with listening and understanding. So then we're able to offer, hopefully, a kind word. More on that another time. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day for our light and momentary troubles, though they may not feel light and may not appear to be momentary, yet in truth they are all relatively light and momentary. They are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So, what do we do? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I think these few verses wrap up neatly and powerfully God's purpose for challenges in our lives that can cause stress and even anxiety. God understands. Cast all your anxiety on Him because He cares for you. Brothers, not all of our stresses and anxieties are going to be resolved quickly. But if we invite God into our situations and we strive for a different mind located on God and with God and not on our issues, then I think God will do His work in us and transform us into Christ-likeness because that's the point. That's why this is all happening. So we become more Christ-like, more useful to God and more relate relatable to people around us who go through similar challenges. I'm not sure that we have time for some questions at this point. Do we, or would you like to do a few? A couple, yeah. Just Can we do a few? Yeah. Okay, let me stop there for, that's the class really, and just say, have we got any comments or questions before we finish for tonight? Yes, Issy, thanks everybody. Mike?